Thank you, Speaker, Honorable Deputy President. Over the past two years, there has been much government rhetoric regarding township economy. At least two extraordinary summits focusing on township economy were held. But since the summits, nothing concrete or measurable seems to have happened. In one of the summits, Deputy President, you said that certain industries need to be ring, ring fenced and procurement of particular goods and services must come from township economies. That being the case, my question is whether government has a register of service providers in any township from which government can procure goods and services. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The Deputy President. Thank you very much. Uh, information at our disposal is the number of SMMEs spread throughout the country in each and every municipality. Uh, those that are registered and those that are not registered. From the information at hand is that instead of SMMEs, small businesses dying, we see the number increasing. Of course, I can account for informal businesses, SMMEs, that are not registered in the formal system. We can account for formal SMMEs that are registered. But the complaint that we have received is that these SMMEs that are doing business with government, they are not paid on time. Hence, some of them, they die. This is one element that we're going to attend, that government must do everything in its power the three spheres of government. Once we enlist or we require services from SMMEs, we must ensure that they are paid on time. Some of the SMMEs are complaining about the infrastructure in their township. They are complaining about the infrastructure in the rural villages. Hence, the revitalization of all these industrial parks that belongs to government. And I said, more or less 670 small businesses have already occupied those industrial parks. And we are sure that the number will increase. Now, what is important probably is to sustain, ensure that the aftercare, when an SMME starts getting business, it must be supported in terms of business management, if it does business with government, it must be paid on time. In that way, we think the rate of success will increase. But once more again, we think government should provide the necessary market for some of the products that are produced by SMMEs because they can't compete evenly with those big companies. There are SMMEs that are producing bricks, they are producing all materials that government used to build roads, build schools, build clinics. SMMEs must be prioritized. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Ntangwini. Uh, I'll take the question for Honorable Ntangwini, Madam Speaker. Uh, Deputy President, according to your NDP, you have a target to reduce unemployment rate by 14% by 2020. Can you please remind the nation, in order to reduce this unemployment, how many jobs did the NDP say should be created? And realistically speaking, can you tell this nation how far are you towards achieving this goal? Thank you. The Honorable the Deputy President. Thank you very much. I might not be precise in terms of the number of jobs that we have set ourselves in the NDP as a target. But all what I can say is that we have not done very well in terms of gradually going closer to that target. There are many factors 
that contributed to that. Definitely, we can only create jobs if we've got an economy that is growing gradually. And an economy that is growing does not really necessarily imply that it will create jobs. There should be an intervention to ensure that as it grows, we ensure that job opportunities uh, are created by those companies because every company that is trading is looking for profit. They will try many ways to reduce what goes to payment to employees and capitalize on profit. So it is important for government to ensure that every business that is open, some of their uh, activities must be labor intensive so that it absorbs people. But I must confess that as a country, because of the fluctuating economy, going down, up and down, we're almost uh, in a recession and we've lost jobs. But the pace at which we have lost jobs has been uh, complemented by new jobs that were created. We're very worried, we're very worried about uh, the advent of new technologies that are being employed in our economy. Businesses are seeking to find better ways to minimize wastages. For instance, you've heard that Standard Bank is closing some of their outlets. Now, in a space of uh, one square kilometers, Standard Bank had four, five outlets. They've just realized that we can do with one outlet. We can service those people. Their tradition and their thinking was that every trading space that is open, they must put a facility. They are changing that notion because people can do their transaction without physically going to the outlet. And as a result, we are going to lose jobs. So as government, we must find better ways to retrain those people, channel them into other sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. Honorable members, that was our fourth supplementary question. We now proceed, Deputy President, to the second question. It was put to you by the Honorable Steinhazen. Deputy thank President. you, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. The question from Honorable Steinhazen. The Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs has reported that the following findings of the Auditor General in the Consolidated General Report on the Local Government Audit Outcomes for the 2017-18 financial year. The Auditor General in that report identified 48 municipalities that require special intervention. In this regard, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs will continue to support and implement support measures to improve leadership and governance in those municipalities, including specific focus on the financial sustainability of those municipalities in question. Among other key areas, support is provided to ensure that action plans are implemented to reverse the negative audit outcomes. In collaboration with National Treasury and SALGA, COCTA is providing targeted support to improve revenue collection, to improve budgeting, account reconciliation, debt management, and the implementation of financial recovery plans. Additionally, COCTA is supporting municipalities through post-audit action plans 
capacity building, and strengthening financial and performance management in those municipalities. These are also complemented by the already deployed teams, district technical support teams, to all those municipalities in question. Through our municipal infrastructure support agency, struggling municipalities are supported to accelerate the implementation of infrastructure projects that addresses the delivery of basic services such as water and sanitation. This is one area where municipalities are greatly challenged. This support also includes procurement, contract management, project management, infrastructure maintenance, and the overall institutional capacity to roll out infrastructure projects. To strengthen government support to local government, the president has appointed an interministerial committee on service delivery at district level to coordinate the work of government on the delivery of services in a manner that responds promptly to community concerns. In the main, this committee will work with COCTA and key service delivery department to respond in an integrated and coordinated fashion to challenges that are raised by our communities. Where appropriate, it will also enlist and mobilize partnerships with the private sector to complement government's resources in trying to respond to agent development and service delivery challenges. We are also cognizant that at its briefing to the NCOP Select Committee, COCTA um, We are cognizant that at its briefing to the NCOP Select Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs on the 16th of July this year, the department indicated that within the next month, it will brief this parliament on a comprehensive five-year strategic framework on how to deal with the challenges that are encountered by our municipalities. This will clearly outline interventions aimed at changing the face of our local municipalities. We also anticipate that Parliament will engage the Department's strategic framework when it is tabled so that together all of us we can ensure that speedy implementation of, of our interventions that are aimed at improving the quality of services to our people are delivered. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honourable Stenezi. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I'm sure the Deputy President would agree with me that part of the service delivery protests happen when promises that are made don't intersect with actual delivery or when the money set aside for delivery uh, is actually siphoned off. Now, one of the key hotspots in South Africa over the course of the last few months has been Alexandra Township in Johannesburg. And I can hear the honorable members on the other side saying, well, it's a DA-run municipality, and absolutely. But I think that, Deputy President, we need to look at what the origin of it is, because money was set aside for the Alex Renewal Project. 160 million rand in 2001 by President Mbeki announced from that very podium where you are. But the truth of the matter, Deputy President, is that money has all been siphoned off. Money spent for housing, sanitation, community development has all been stolen. And as a result, those services have not been rolled out. Given the fact that the Gauteng MEC of housing refuses to cooperate with the Human Rights Commission looking into this, would you, Deputy President, announce to us what steps your government is taking to look into what happened to that funding, where those funds were siphoned off for from by ANC members, and steps that you're going to take to ensure that these service delivery crises that are there are actually dealt with properly. Thank on, you. On a point of yes, order, sir. A point of order? Yes, sir. I'm rising on Rule 137. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank rule you very one much. Rule 137 provides that the follow-up question must be relevant to the original question. The question asked is a new question altogether. Thank you, sir. M
can I rule on this? The follow-up question is on issues related to townships. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. The, the question of Alexander, it's obviously an issue that government is concerned about. You'll be aware that the President visited Alexander. And definitely we are going to cooperate with the provincial government and the municipality to deal with the problem in Alexander. We are going to work with Mayor Mashaba, we are going to work with Premier Makura to deal with the problem. We, in the process, will find out what happened because before dealing with the problem, we are going to get the history of that pro, uh, 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 project. But we can promise the people of Alexander that as government, we are going to coordinate our efforts irregardless of our party affiliation. We are going to work with the DA to deliver, to build those houses, to make Alexander a better place to live in. I don't know. I don't know. Now, if you know someone who has stolen money there, please report this to the nearest police station as we speak, if you know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Thank President. You. The Honorable Shengwa. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Mr. Deputy President, the audit outcomes reveal, amongst other things, that the financial statements submitted for audit by municipalities are inconsistent with the reporting format. The concern, however, is that of the municipalities that are accused of this, they then use consultants and in total spent an amount of 907 million rands to pay those consultants. Therefore, the fundamental question becomes, Mr. Deputy President, there's an acknowledgement, yes, that the skills are not there, but even when consultants can't do the work that they are being paid for, that's the problem. So what is it specifically that government is going to do to ensure that the necessary requisite skills are present, alive, and that people who are fit for purpose are actually employed in municipalities? Because obviously we are tripping one financially after the other with the same problem. 13 municipalities over the past five years have received adverse or disclaimed findings, not one with, with an 139 intervention. So the, the issue of consequence management becomes another concern here. So I hear all the things you are saying, but what are the speedy interventions that will happen? Because come next year, the same problem is going to arise. Thank you, sir. The Deputy President. Thank you very much. Um, I think as government, we realize and we we are cognizant of the problems that are affecting municipalities, um, as shown by the, the audit outcomes. And as government, we've accepted that we cannot make this problem a problem of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. That is why the president said we must have a team of departments a committee of departments that would work with COCTA so that we make a speedy intervention. Now, we need to deploy people with technical expertise in various sections and programs of municipalities, whether financial or technical, so that we support those areas. But where there are problems of service delivery because of the lack of right personnel, Pro, uh, projects are uncompleted, this team will intervene, supporting the Department of Cooperative Governance. We, we acknowledge the fact that there might be a challenge in terms of leadership in all our municipalities. The management of the affairs of the municipality uh, is not at its best. Hence, this team supporting COCTA will come close to that space. 
We are aware of the many service delivery protests that have turned violent. And it's important that as government, we should not leave these service pro uh, delivery protests just to go unabated. It's important that this committee must go in, sit down with the people, sit down with the municipality, bring the province, bring national department, intervene, solve the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Akbara Vassos. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the people of Mafube local municipality are currently suffering as a result of a complete shutdown of the municipality. Vehicles and banking accounts of this municipality have been seized by court order because of outstanding debt and no service delivery is currently taking place. Violent protests have followed and this municipality has been under section 139 administration for the last two years already. My question is, has Mafube been identified as a service delivery hotspot and what will be done by your government to provide immediate relief to the people of Mafube and solve this total shutdown as the provincial government has proven that they can't and the normal support programs have failed and will continue to fail. Uh, thank you. Deputy President. Well, the municipality under question is part of those municipalities that have been identified by the Auditor General as municipalities that have collapsed in terms of providing services. So definitely it's going to be one of the priority municipality that will be visited. And those visits will happen very soon. I can therefore say what measures are going to be taken. We want to know exactly what is the problem. Uh, if a municipality is put under Section 139, of course, the NCOP also is part of that process. So we're going to get all the people that are part of uh, the challenges that are there and find an immediate solution. As much as we're talking about internal problems in the municipality, we must ensure that people don't suffer the, uh, the deliver of services because we're still talking. We need to unblock those blockages that are there so that people can get water, people can get electricity while fixing issues inside the municipality. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Mchaisa. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. The question is, no and great stalker on how it can engage. Oh. Yeah, don't shout at me, please. Have you engaged Salka on how it can engage accountability in getting institutions such as public accounts committee and to address the flag and all compliance issues emerging from the AG's report? Thank you, sir. The Honorable the Deputy President. Well, like we've said, uh, Honourable Speaker, that all issues that have been raised by the Auditor General are on our radar screen. And these are the issues that would uh, be part of our intervention uh, program. First of all, the Auditor General has raised a number of issues about each and every municipalities that are wrong. So instead of going somewhere and find new issues. Start with those issues that already have been identified as problematic. So we're going to do just that. Thank you, Deputy President. That takes care of the second question. We proceed to the third question. That question was put to you by the Honorable Shibambo, but my instructions are that the Honorable Ndlozi will take care of the question. Deputy President. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Section 209.1 of the Constitution of the Republic provides that any intelligence service other than the intelligence division of the defense force or the police service may be established only by the president as the head of the national executive and only in terms of national legislation. 
Currently, the National Strategic Intelligence Act, number 39 of 1994, defines the functions of members of the national intelligence structures. The relevant members of the national intelligence structures provided for in terms of the act to support government with intelligence services are the following. The intelligence division of the National Defense Force, the intelligence division of the South African Police, the State Security Agency, and the service. As things stand, there is no bill that the executive has considered or processed in respect of establishing the inter intelligence services in any government departments and state-owned entities. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Ngozi. Uh, thank you, Deputy President and uh, Speaker. Deputy President, would you agree that if there was a unit inside SARS which collected intelligence using covert means, would, according to this answer that you've just provided, be illegal, meaning it would be a rogue unit. And as a result, it would mean that your government has to either take action against the individuals involved, secondly, disband it, uh, but thirdly, uh, Deputy President, uh, make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Honorable Deputy President. Thank you very much. Um, the honorable member would uh, appreciate the fact that this matter that you're speaking about as we speak, it's in front of the court. As to determine whether that unit was correctly established or not correctly established. So it would be really prematurely or wrong for us to start talking about the matter that is before court. Let's allow the court Let's allow the court to finalize the matter without us talking about it and putting our views. Thank you very much. Uh, point of order, Speaker. What is your point of order? With the greatest respect, uh, Honorable Speaker, there is a precedence. The matter of sub care was clarified that indeed we can, because there is no court that can suspend because of the separation of powers, your government being held accountable about the activities happening under your watch. Essentially, you are saying we can't do our duty until a court says so. So a matter can be commented on. There is a ruling of this house to that effect, Honorable Speaker. I plead with you, direct the Deputy President in line with the Constitution to answer the question and not say, no, I don't want to answer it. He must be held accountable. His government must be held accountable. What if there was a rogue unit within SARS established by Honorable Jamnandis? Isn't it obvious that Honorable your Chair. government must take action against Honorable him Chair. and all those that uh, participated in that uh, unit? Order, Thank Chair. you, Honorable Thanks. Members. May Thanks. I rule on this point of order? Order. Chair. Order. Honorable Members. Honorable Ndlosi says we must rule on this matter. The truth of the matter is that this matter is not only in front of the court, it is pending the decision of the court. Secondly, you do have a rule that says when any matter is pending a judicial decision, it's very specific, that we cannot talk, um, talk on it. I don't think that um, that says that we are mum or that we are scared or that we can't deal with the matter. I think that um, the precedence you are referring to is something that I would look at, but for now I will rule that that question be this supplementary, be set aside until I can get clarity on that and therefore that Deputy President, your response for, the, for today is sufficient. I want to 
Honorable Ndlozi, I do not want to enter into a question and answer session with you. Deputy President, please take your seat. Uh, speaker, I respect that. Oh, can I address you, Speaker? You will address me. Thanks. Uh, I respect that. But can we get an assurance that then you will direct him to write that answer to us? Because you are going to make up your mind, as you say, Honorable Speaker, as to whether you should persuade the Deputy President to answer. Because we submitted a question. This is the follow-up. We are well within our rights. If you arrive at the determination that the Deputy, the deputy President, there's no court order that says we can't hold him accountable. If you arrive at such a determination, can you please have him put it in writing? Because our supplementary question was not answered. Thank you very much. The supplementary question was answered. And um, I want to say that I find it very difficult, members, to all of you, when you instruct us how to rule, when we are presiding. It's very problematic. I've ruled on this matter, and it will stay there. Honorable Steinhazen, you have a matter? Madam Speaker, may I request that this matter is referred to the Rules Committee? Because we have had precedence in the past. We've got rulings from the Honorable Ginwala made in the House before and as well as in the Fifth Parliament. The sub judicate rule does no longer apply in South African law. The MIDI television case that was held in the Constitutional Court was very clear on that. What we can't do is discuss the merits of the case. But frankly, there are other issues that relate to the so-called rogue unit that have been dispensed with already by the Nugent Commission, as well as by, a, 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 um, by, by Parliament. And I think that to rule this type of question out of order uh, it severely impedes members of parliament's ability to do that. So may I ask that this ruling is referred to the Rules Committee urgently because otherwise ministers and the executive are going to hide behind the sub judicate rule continuously, continuously in spite of the MIDI television uh, ruling in the courts. Thank you. Honourable members, I will refer this to the Rules Committee, but my ruling stands. The supplementary to the Deputy President says he must express an opinion and that opinion would be out of order since he is not a court. And that is why I'm ruling it out of order. Can we proceed, please, to the Honorable Singh? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Speaker, one can only smile at how loaded this question is. But it's a right of any member to ask any question in this House. But that aside, Honorable Deputy President, gathering information as such is not illegal if done within the confines of the law. Businesses gather information, state-owned entities gather information, and that's commonly referred to as due diligence. And I trust, Honorable Deputy President, that the government is not intending to uh, silence those that enter into a, a due diligence process. For example, Denel may want to examine what the uh, ground is like when they get an order for arms. And they would look at other suppliers around the world and they would do a due diligence. Is it the intention of government to suppress any state-owned entity from entering into the principle of due diligence? Thank you. Deputy President. Thank you very much. Probably I should refer you to the Act. I'm going to read some extracts from the Act so that probably it will clarify all of us. Functions of other departments of state with reference to national security intelligence. If any law expressly or by implication requires that department of state other than the agency or the service to perform any function with regard to the security of the republic or combating of any threat to the security of the Republic. Such law shall be deemed to empower such department to gather departmental intelligence and to evaluate, correlate, interpret such intelligence for the purpose of discharging such function. Provided that such department of state shall not gather departmental intelligence within the, the Republic in a covert manner, provided such Department of State shall not gather departmental intelligence outside the Republic in a covert manner. I can proceed and proceed. But, 
But, but, but any, any department that seeks to gather information, it should do that through a law. And that law should come through this parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Sheikhman. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Deputy President, let me remind this House that there are legal experts that are saying that this rogue unit is not necessarily illegal, even though it hadn't come via the President. But that's the first thing. But the intelligence in South Africa, in my view, Deputy President, is ineffective. Had it been effective, then of course my friends in red would not have looted the VBS bank for starters. They would not have evaded the SARS and they would have paid their taxes. Yeah, po po now, point of what are you going to do, yeah. Deputy President, to ensure point that intelligence is more effective Honorable in South Africa? Imam, have you finished putting your question? There is no question. I'm raising on a point of order. Can I address him first? Have you finished say, putting your question? Deputy President, what are you going to do to ensure that we have a more effective intelligence to prevent the looting of funds like what has happened by my friends in red with the VBS bank and Thank the evasion you, of taxes in South Africa through SARS? Can Thank you please you, tell us? Honorable Ndlozi, you, wrote on, you rose on a yes. point of order. What yes, is your uh, point of order? The point of order is that the honorable member says there are people who are wearing red, and Honorable Barbara Day is wearing red, who have looted VBS Bank. The chief, the chief whip of the house is wearing red. Has she looted VBS Bank? If that's the case, he's impugning on the reputation of honorable members without a substantive motion. I would rule that you rule him out of order, and he must withdraw those comments, because people who are wearing red in this house, there's no court of law that have said they've looted any bank. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Point of order. Your point of order, sir. The point of order, Madam Speaker, is simply this, and the Honourable Sheikh doesn't have a whip in the House, so it falls on me to do it. There's been plenty of precedent in the House that a member can make any comment about a political party. He can't make it about individuals. So even if the Honourable Sheikh had said the EFF had looted uh, from VBS, it would have been within the rules. If it identified an individual and said, individual or member X have done it, it would have been outside the rule. The Honourable Sheikh is well within the rights of, uh, to, to say what he did. Speaker, Honourable Deputy President, please take your seat. Honourable Mkalipi. Speaker, on a point of order, mm. we can't move on that premise because if someone stood up here and said the DA have stole the land, that one is going to be a problem. So please ask Sheikh Iman not to provoke the EFF because there is no court of law or any report for that matter have found any EFF on that report. Point of order, Chair. So we must not enter into that debate, especially with this member Honorable who members. has a fraud case. But we don't speak about that fraud case here, Speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable members, may I rule? Order. Order. Honorable members, it is not unparliamentary to refer to a political party. We've had precedents. If you remember 2014, there was a matter taken to court by the EFF, and that matter we lost as parliament because they referred to the ANC in a particular manner. So the, that the Honorable Sheikh Imam went in a very roundabout way to pose this question and referred to members wearing red is actually not unparliamentary. So I rule against that. Honorable Deputy President, please proceed. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. The Honorable the members, please take your seat. The assertion the assertion by the honourable member who asked the follow-up question that our intelligence structures 
are not up to scratch. Um, I'll differ with that. I'll differ with that because as we stand, we're in a very secure country. We, we are out of any threat. We're not threatened as, as South Africa. Our defense is doing very well. Our police are very, doing very well. Of course, there might be issues that will crop from time to time, but that does not mean our intelligence structures are ineffective. There, I beg to differ. They are, the country is stable. There's no threat that you can say there's foreign invasion, there's this and this. Our intelligence structures are effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The last supplementary goes to the Honorable Mkalipi. Honorable Mkalipi, have you forfeited? Okay. If she has forfeited that, the Honorable Mag have you forfeited? The Honorable Makwanishi. Thank you, thank you very much, Deputy uh, st uh, Speaker. The state security agency is very critical for our national security, economic stability, for sustenance of our democracy, amongst others. Improvement of the regulatory mechanism is agent to split domestic and foreign branches, as promised by the President in his State of the Nation address. We also need these regulatory mechanisms to deal with the creation of the position of Deputy Inspector of General of Intelligence. Uh, can I have your comments, Deputy President, on that? Thank you, sir. The Deputy President? Well, the comment is that uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. We then proceed to our fourth question. That question was put to you by the Honorable Jay Shabalala, the Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Our country's blueprint, the National Development Plan, clearly states that in order to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality, South Africa has to raise the levels of employment and thereby ensuring that people earn incomes and sustain their livelihoods. As one of our major public employment initiatives, the Expanded Public Works Program is our flagship program which contributes to the National Development Plan's core objective of achieving a decent standard of living for all South Africans by 2030. This program focuses on creating opportunities that enhances the acquisition of skills across a range of trade areas such as construction, plumbing, welding, painting, infrastructure maintenance, just to name a few. In the process, those who are participating, they are paid stipends to sustain themselves and their families, thereby impacting and mitigating extreme poverty in our communities. Central to the objectives of this program is ensuring that Based on training and skills acquired during training, EPWP beneficiaries can now move into sustainable employment within the labor market. Alternatively, new pathways are created for these EPWP beneficiaries to engage in business ventures create, creation, utilizing training and skills acquired in the program. Experience from the implementation of this program indicates that the program has contributed towards the alleviation of poverty and the provision of work experience to participants. Since phase one of the program, more than 10 million work opportunities have been created with over 64 billion paid in wages to participants. Even though the expanded public works program offers short-term employment, the income support it provides in terms of wages 
to all those who are participating makes a meaningful contribution towards reducing prevailing levels of poverty. As it enters its fourth phase, the expanded work, uh, public works program will continue to draw its significant number of unemployed South Africans, especially our young people, into productive work in a manner that will enable them to gain skills, increase their capacity to earn an income, and contribute towards the betterment of our country. However, to broaden the scale and impact, the increased participation of the private sector and other non-state actors will be critical in the implementation of EPWP phase four. Our experience suggests that while government has invested in this program over the past few years, private sector participation has been limited or non-existent. One of the major challenges facing the program in provinces has to do with the placement of EPWP graduates after the end of their contracted period. Some of the beneficiaries have had to go back home. As an unintended consequence, this has created an expectation that government has to employ all these EPWP graduates. Such a position is physically, I mean, physically untenable and unsustainable. We need an approach that draws in a significant contribution from our private sector play partners. Our close collaboration with the private sector will ensure that a placement plan is jointly agreed to in order to ensure that opportunities are created by companies for the placement of some of these EPWP participants after graduating, depending on the skills that they've acquired. As part of increasing the intake of young people into public employment, government has already removed the requirement of experience as one of the criteria in the re recruitment of new graduates. Going forward, the work of the Anti-Poverty Interministerial Committee will integrate our public employment program with other anti-poverty initiatives focusing on broad-based participation in the productive sectors of our economy. As we have highlighted in our earlier response, it is critical to prioritize the development of rural and township economies as part of boosting employment prospects in those poverty-stricken areas. Alongside public employment programs, specific focus will continue to be put on enterprise and skills development initiatives to empower our unemployed young people to participate in all key sectors of our economy. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Shabalala. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Deputy President, um, the issue of providing EPWP uh, jobs as a short-term um, measure to alleviate poverty whilst empowering the beneficiaries of certain skills acquisition. Reality of the situation is that we want young people to create, to turn these jobs to create employment, uh, rather sustainable employment, that's the first thing. Now, David President mentions the fourth phase and the 10 million young people that have been absorbed. Uh, public sector has done away with the issue of uh, young people required to have experience in the entry level. What are we going to do to ensure the private sector also tailor-made? But what is the monitoring evaluation that we're going to do to say the private sector is playing an, an advancement role? So we need the private sector to come on board on the issue. But the question is that, uh, Deputy President, what are we going to do to ensure the private sector plays the role, but ensure the economy is also growing to a certain level where we can be able to create sustainable uh, jobs on this EPWP. I thank you. Deputy President, you have been given a number of supplementaries in that question. Mm -hmm. um, I have identified about three. You are free to respond to one. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Well, uh, I think uh, on the side of government, the shortcoming is that uh, 
we have not persuaded the private sector enough. Uh, the president has made an announcement that we are going to eliminate the experience part for new entrants in the public service. For us as government, we must persuade the private sector to afford our young people an opportunity to gain experience, remove this requirement that any post that is advertised, there's a requirement of experience. So we must do our part in order to motivate and persuade the private sector to join government so that we deal with this unemployment. Well, the second part is that this program, as much as it's offering people short-term employment, it's not aimed at creating permanence. But what we recognize that it deals with poverty at that time, it also offers these young people skills that they can use to find employment or to create their own small enterprises. So this program must be supported. Some of the young people who participated in the PWP are now run, running their small enterprises and they are being supported. So it's a good program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Graham. Deputy President, you've waxed lyrical about the public employment programs and the numbers of work opportunities they've provided. But let's be honest here. The EPWP is nothing more than a social security program. Nowhere is this more evident than in the fact that EPWP participants are paid at 55% of the minimum wage. Yet you yourself, Deputy President, have said that the ANC believes that the national minimum wage is not a living wage, but a significant milestone towards it. And yet, in an interesting plot twist, former Deputy Minister Jeremy Cronin admitted that if EPWP participants were to be paid at the minimum wage, the number of people employed in the program would decline by 50% due to lack of affordability. That's certainly an interesting justification for non-compliance with your own laws. So this then begs the question, in a country where almost 10 million people are unemployed, Your question, please. You've got two seconds. And where the minimum wage is recognized as a barrier to employment and not being implemented, why would government impose a national minimum wage on all other sectors, including the private sector? Thank you, ma'am. Deputy President. Thank you very much. Our understanding of this program is that uh, all the participants that are there are given a stipend, but not only a stipend. They are offered an opportunity to gain skills. They are offered training. And that training, it's money. Uh, government, it's paying money to train those participants in the different skills that are there, whether construction, plumbing, and all that. We, we consider this as a stipend, as people participate, as people try and gain the necessary skills that is why it's a short-term program that takes an individual to a certain point where this individual can find gainful employment because of the skill in position or start his or her own business. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Chase. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Madam Speaker, Deputy President, would you consider the establishment of poverty alleviation fund that would express focus on the poverty alleviation projects so as to assist many that are poor, more especially the people that are living in squalor conditions? Thank you. Deputy President. Well, and I haven't thought of uh, the creation of a fund, because fighting poverty should be a coordinated effort, stemming from different role players, departments, 
spheres of government collaborating to deal with the poverty-stricken area. Poverty is not only getting food. Provision of uh, infrastructure, schools, roads, water, everything. So this needs an integrated effort to those who are charged with certain responsibilities of providing roads, of providing schools. So creating a fund will defeat this collaborative idea that we're putting forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Swart. Thank you, Speaker. Deputy President, the ACDP believes that in view of the high unemployment rates, that as part of a wider employment plan, public employment can, to a certain limited degree, complement private sector employment. However, and this is uh, in response to your first question, uh, the first question, policymakers agree the thriving SMMEs is a key to job creation in the country. And the NDP, as indicated earlier, predicts 11 million new jobs are needed by 2030, 90% by SMEs. Now, a key finding in the EPWP phase three review was that partnerships should be strengthened with the private sector. And it was alluded to by in an earlier question. And you answered, how can that be strengthened? But surely, Deputy President, would you give us an indication that one of the problems with SMMEs is access to funding? Would you agree that if there's greater funding for SMEs, they will be able to partner with the EPWP phases and create more jobs. And is that something that government will be looking into, considering that SMEs are the greatest job creation mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy President. I, I, I agree with that uh, assertion. Um, because in the program of EPWP, as much as we are intervening in terms of poverty, giving people stipends, what is long term is that these people come out of the program with a skill. Now with that skill, they can start their own business or can, they can find employment. Now you are saying, as you support EPWP, the gaining of skills, the training, you must also support SMMEs because the likelihood is that these people are going to be absorbed by these SMMEs. And that is what we're doing. Government has decided to create a department of small business so that we can place focus squarely on growing small enterprises. And we're going to support the Minister of uh, Small Business, work together so that these SMMEs are supported and there is an aftercare program that they don't fail, they don't relapse, so that an opportunity is created to absorb these participants of EPWP. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. That is, uh, puts us at the end of the question number four. We proceed to question number five. It was put to you by the Honorable Ngwezi, Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. As we have indicated earlier, part of the new responsibilities delegated to us by the President is to coordinate intervention aimed at stimulating rural and township economies. This work includes facilitation of social economic empowerment models for increased economic inclusion at local level, championing of high impact tourism empowerment projects for rural and township communities, and facilitation of linkages to private and public markets and value chains for SMMEs in our special economic zones across the country. For the benefit of the House, the social economic empowerment models we are referring to here as per our delegated responsibility flows from an appreciation 
that across the country, in every province, in every district, there are a number of local economic development initiatives that are working. Of course, they are fragmented and they are disconnected. We believe that if these economic activities were to be consolidated, coordinated, with a view to alleviate and elevate their potential business and growth pot uh, uh, potential, a lot of our rural and township enterprises can be uplifted and supported to become sustainable with the capacity to contribute to our local economic development, capacity to uh, contribute to job creation in these districts and local communities. In the process, the much needed employment to respond to the present youth unemployment challenge could be addressed. We trust that you will agree with us, honorable members, that rural and township economies are places where there's vast untapped productive capacities and markets. Think of how many panel beatings, uh, spray painting operations, how many wheels and tire operations, how many carpentry welding, textile and creative industries that are found in many parts of our townships and rural areas. Think of how many women-led small-scale informal enterprises that are there to feed uh, these entrepreneurs' families and educate their children. The potential in our township and rural areas is vast and it's untapped. These are the real small businesses that must be uplifted and provided with the necessary support, whether financial or non-financial, so that they can prosper. Our models should ask what purpose will be development of big malls, big shopping centers, which does not serve or support local markets and value chains in those townships and rural areas. For township and rural economies to thrive, Localization and reinforcing of certain economic sectors to really achieve transformation should be the primary pillars of this program. We will not meaningfully address the existing obstacles to sustainable participation of black people, especially those who are operating within township and rural economies, if we do not take bold actions currently to create the necessary conditions that will deconcentrate economic activity from big players. Therefore, dealing with this unemployment challenge requires a comprehensive and a coordinated approach that is targeted and multi-sectoral. This effort requires careful and coordinate coordination of relevant opportunities taking into account the level of know-how of unemployed young people. While government does, not, does have various interventions and partnerships through national government, provincial government, and our agencies, we need to ensure that all these interventions that are targeted to address youth unemployment must be part of a multi-pronged intervention which includes skills development, especially for those young people who are not in any employment, who are not in any education facility or training. Furthermore, we need to direct industrial funding towards our young people to provide the capital for the growth and expansion of their ideas. Four years ago, Targets were set for industrial financing to young empowered enterprises over the period of five years. Within one year that is left in this period, 
the Industrial Development Corporation has already exceeded its target, providing more than 5.1 billion in funding to more than 120 youth-empowered enterprises. In addition to funding our youth, we have to find ways to open up markets so that new enterprises can complete and compete fairly. Earlier this month, the Competition Amendment Act was promulgated by the President as a key focus of this amendment is an opening of markets where concentration and the behavior of dominant firms is harmful to the creation of jobs and the growth of small and medium businesses in sectors across our economy. Our response therefore seeks to consolidate various impactful initiatives that are being implemented in fragmented ways by some provincial governments and national departments. The intervention will identify, develop, and support qualifying SMMEs in order to support them to become competitive manufacturers and suppliers of building materials where this could be sourced for development of human settlements and paving of municipal roads and pathways. For our partners government, we will continue to support SMMEs and cooperatives through targeted procurement initiatives for government infrastructure and human settlement projects. As we move forward, the Anti-Poverty Interministerial Committee will prioritize the implementation of economic empowerment models that aggregate government procurement spend in key areas to drive the incubation and participation of small business in general and in township and rural areas. We are pleased that some of government departments and provinces have started with piloting and implementing some of these initiatives. For instance, the Department of Small Business Development is implementing an aggregated community produce for school nutrition program while in Pumalanga, where I come from, the province has begun with the implementation of government nutrition program to stimulate agricultural production and empower upcoming farmers to supply fresh produce to government institutions such as hospitals and schools. In Wazulu Natal, the radical agrarian social economic transformation provides support to small scale farmers by offering the markets access to leverage on government procurement. There are various economic empowerment models that are being implemented in other provinces. But like we have said, our, our approach is fragmented. Our task as the center of government is to lead, coordinate, consolidate our efforts to expand the scale and the impact. As we upscale these programs, we must pay particular attention to the incubation of young people and women-owned enterprises to support their meaningful participation in our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Ngwezi. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Mshengu Nyabonga Ngempendulo Ong Nigazayon. Kota Zabanguti Uzo Melana Nam Mangiti Ezinye Ze Sombulula Nomi Kazulu in Negazayo are long term solutions. And Iwa Riami Engolo Uguti Abant Basenism Africa, especially youth, is stacked on unemployment as we speak. So all we will need are quick wins, uh, Honorable David President, quick solutions. Anga Veza Matuem Sebes in Jenga Manj. Zaluwa Ziga Sayala Munga Melguti. Magube office lakho no hulmeni, bana zoini kazululo, e putumayo, ez na shesha zita la matubem sebenz. No gutiya my sekona matubem sebenz. Senzaranja and gutubi abant basenizm Africa, abazuza kala glau matuba no guba guzuza banta bakamoga manya mas nyatoza. Siabong, Deputy President. Ngiabong, 
Viazogala Uguti, Isimo, Espegenena, so sitting Uguti, Gushesh, Gulung is a log of Sigbonai. Sugan the foot Masinian. Guvamisegi legi Uguti is into Esizenza Masinian. Zinga be sustainable. Gufanelo Gutes Gwenza Manj. Gube building block. Ya logos is a Gwenza in future. Jongova Mount Kalindela of a thousand miles. Uzo Kalanga one mile. But finally, you will reach a thousand miles. Manje ge. Nanoma isi mosibona galasisi bigakul. If you go to Gutico, Nimizamo, Enzegayo, General Engi Bali, Ibali and Jaguti ITC, he supported Labantu Lava, he supported Labantu Lava, Guko, Nagwenzegayo, Siguenza, Sisuge, Esukela, Lao Guti, Nalogis of Wenz, Uguti Zotanganisa, Zonke Lizin, this is Enza Sisuge, Uguze. I impact ye to Ibe Gul. Ama provinces enza look, u national wenza look, a woman's pala benza look. Si funu guti, umasi, pega indaba, eh, yoksuela galagum sebins, wabanda bangan, si shangane, si u national, si ama province, si umas pal. Moba gaze, zinengi, e e kungo. As a support, I own a mali as a cure woman. Now, pan the government department. Oxuela, Uguti, Siba Cise, Siba Landelele, Baziba Pumelele, Labanta Bangan, Abakalama business wap. Forty year, Oguni, Gufunasi, Sukizele, Ugut, Abanta Bangan, Gufanele by Escolini, Batole, Icono, Loguenza, Umsebins. Ogoti bakashe. Ama program esu kulumenga o opit EPWP. Ama trainings ate kriti sagalala. Kota skelu guta bantu bagi tabangan. Abaye glezu skungo. Batole i training. Batole i kono el tile. Loguti bagwazu kashe. Futi bagwazu noguti bakale eyabo i kampa. Ezo sizo hulmen. Funugusho ke ukuthi indlela le ingabonakala yinde futhi bonakala inzima kodwa indlela esilingele thina abantu base South Africa ukuthi sihambe nale inkinga esiphambi kwazo sizidazulule akukho ke okungasihlula uma sibambene futhi si focused ku leo program ngiyabonga ngiyabonga babu njengise Uh, uh, thank you very much. That will, that will change up. Just hold. Honorable members, I follow the system. As you press, you are recorded, and I follow that list very religiously. That in Chaisa, please, you have the floor. Uh, well spoken, Madam Speaker. <coughs> uh, Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I think. I'm covered by the deputy president because what what I wanted. No, let wait, please. You must learn to wait. You you what, are on what, the floor. Don't what, what don't I address wanted, the members. Address the chair. Thank you very much. What I wanted to know is that because the cre creation of two million jobs within a decade is not something easy. Then I would like now the deputy president to elaborate on this great in initiative. How is it going to make a success? But somehow you have covered me in this very response that you have done. But you have got more. You can still say more. Thank you very much. Hey. Deputy President. No, I don't have more. I'm the, fine. Thank you. <laughs> the Honorable Tabe <laughs> Kulu. I'm so sorry, Speaker. I have forfeited my, 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 my follow-up question. The Honorable Sheikh, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Deputy President, we do agree that there is very high unemployment rate, particularly amongst the youth. 
the Tibet colleges have a pass rate of 1 in 10. There is a massive skills shortage in the country while there's an abundance in other skills. Now that is as a result of the fact that the skills at Tibet colleges do not speak to the skills needs of the country. Now, how are you going to address that to ensure that, and I'll give you an example. South Africa has a shortage of plumbers, electricians, carpenters, and things. At the same time, we have millions of people with BCom degrees that are doing nothing, or people that are taking on those things where we have a skills excess. How are you going to actually deal with this to try and address that? So there's some coordination between the needs of the country, because remember, Tibbets are Your to a large extent is. funded by government. Thank you. Deputy President. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I've been assigned the responsibility by the President to, to chair the Human Resource Development Council. And now, in that council, we have got uh, the private sector, we have got civil society, we have got government. This question came a number of times that there is a skills mismatch in the country. We are producing, we are training young people that cannot be absorbed by our private sector. It's a matter that it's on the table and it's possible that our training can be tailor-made to suit the needs of industry. But of course, any skill that is acquired by a young person, that skill is important. We are not only looking at giving young people a skill so that they can be employed. We are giving them a skill so that they can also be employers. So it's a two-pronged process because there is a program where government is consistently supporting small enterprises so that they can grow and be big enterprises. Now, any economy that is thriving has its foundation the small, medium enterprises that are able to employ one or two, up to 100 people. Those SMMEs are an important mixture in any economy uh, for that economy to thrive. So what I'm saying is it's a matter that the council is going to discuss the skills mismatch but whatever skills that are out there, people have acquired, they can put them into best use. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Honorable Cardo. Deputy President, Statistics South Africa has released data showing that black South Africans aged between 25 and 34 are less skilled than their parents. Furthermore, according to former statistician general Pali Lahotla, since 1994, in comparison to their white Indian and colored counterparts, black youths have, quote, lost out in acquiring skills, which is the crux of youth unemployment and a sign of regression, close quote. Deputy President, why has the ANC government allowed this regression to take place and what is it doing to develop the skills of all our youth so that they are ready for the fourth industrial revolution? Thank you, sir, the Deputy President. Um, I partly agree with that assertion because I have the labor survey uh, from States SA about the number of young people that are not in training, that are not, at, uh, that are not employed, uh, that are not in any education institution. Well, it's a big number. It's a big number. It's important that this government probably will come down, down below what you call the Tivet College. We must think of a college that will accommodate those of our young people 
We don't have metric. We have not passed grade A7. Now, for a TVET college, there are certain requirements, entry requirements, that can exclude some of the young people. So it's important as government, and it's a matter that we're discussing as a council, to say, come up with a community college that would not require any entrance uh, uh, qualification. Take every young person, uh, assess that young person, give this young person a skill. Because most of these young people, because of their conditions, where they live, they could not go to school. As much as we've made education as the ANC government free, children that are attending our primary schools, children that are attending our secondary schools, they do so free. And, and they get food at school. Well, there are some, there are some uh, public schools where parents, governing bodies agree that we can pay money because we can afford. But there's no child that can be excluded on the basis of non-affordability. That is known. But there are areas in our rural communities where these young people did not present themselves in, in any facility, school. Now, these are the young people that are not in education, that are not in training, that are not employed. Now, what do you do with them? Now, they can be ad admitted in a university, they can be admitted in a college. Now, create a facility that will accommodate them, but finally, give them a skill, train them. So that is the matter that is before our council. It's a matter that is confronting this government, but you know where we come from with this matter. It's a matter of our historical past, which we're trying to address. And we're not consistently blaming that past. What is before us is to address those challenges. But let's not forget where we come from. Thank you very much. Deputy President, we proceed, Deputy President, to your last question for the day. That question was put to you by the Honorable Grunewald, Deputy President. Oh, he's still here. Honorable Speaker, thank you very much. In line with our delegated responsibility to accelerate land reform program, our government remains committed to pursuing this program without disrupting agricultural production. In this regard, our focus will be to ensure the effective coordination of integrated farmer support, interventions including small-scale farmers, and link them to market value chains. In the course of the implementation of this program, we are mindful of the challenges faced by farmers related to droughts, which is exacerbated by climate change, as well as rising input costs that impact negatively on agricultural production, resulting in job losses and closure of some of these agricultural enterprises. As government will not allow our agricultural sector to collapse because farmers are the lifeblood of our economy. That is why part of our response to these challenges, we have set aside a package of financial assistance to affected farmers in various provinces. I'm advised by the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development that various provinces were assisted with drought relief funding. In this regard, the Free State, Northern Cape, and Eastern Cape provinces are among the provinces that received drought relief funding during the last quarter of 2018-19 financial year. This does not amount 
to agricultural subsidies, but our effort as government to alleviate the negative impact that this drought may have had on our farmers and uh, sustainability of these small enterprises in those provinces. Allow me briefly to enumerate some of the funding allocated and dispersed to all the approved provinces. Funds were dispersed from the National Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries to various provinces for implementation of projects according to their needs assessment. In this regard, 20 million was allocated to the Eastern Cape, 13.5 million was allocated to the Free State, 43 million was allocated to the Northern Cape, 10 million allocated to Limpopo, 10 million allocated to Mpumalanga, 170 million was allocated to Western Cape. Both the Northern Cape and Eastern Cape Departments of Agriculture provided fodder to the affected farmers, while the Free State Department of Agriculture is currently providing relief in terms of water infrastructure projects, including boreholes and desilting of dams. The main focus was on subsistence and smallholder farmers. However, in provinces like the Western Cape and the Northern Cape, all categories of farmers benefited in these affected municipalities. Fodder and water infrastructure were used to support affected livestock in terms of feeding and drinking water. Some farmers have bought livestock and crop and will use the water for irrigation as well. The Department of Agriculture and Land Reform and Rural Development in collaboration with provincial departments of agriculture will continuously provide and disseminate early warning information, awareness and drought coping mechanism. Provinces are also putting measures in place to assist these affected farmers. In terms of the processes, in cases of drought, municipal and district agricultural offices guide farmers in terms of legislated processes relating to support as outlined in our Disaster Management Act. This act stipulates that provinces and municipalities must set aside a percentage or reprioritize their budgets to address the disaster in terms of relief and recovery. When this percentage has been exhausted, the province or the municipality concerned may access funds from national treasury, which is managed by national treasury through the National Disaster Management uh, Center, housed at the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs to deal with all disaster matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Grunewald. Achbare Speaker, I don't know if you have a president of Afrikaans mag to say that you have English to say. I'm very poor in Afrikaans. Very thank you. In that case... I don't understand. Uh, yes. Okay, yes. Fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. No, no, sure. I appreciate yes, that. Yes. I think the Honorable Deputy President have mentioned the challenges of the agricultural sector in South Africa. The fact of the matter is that I don't think people always realize the impact, for instance, of drought. I read an article in a newspaper the other day where business people in Durban, for instance, are very worried about the drought in the Northern Cape because they sell uh, certain food products like, uh, what do they call it? Bunny chows. I don't eat bunny chows, but they, they eat bunny chows. But they have the special bunny chows with karua lamb, which is very, very favorable sort of food in Durban. But now they are affected by the drought and they are losing some of their business. 
My question and my follow-up question to the Honorable Deputy President is, we acknowledge and the farming community also are thankful for the fact that the government give certain reliefs. But my follow-up is, the problem is with the administration. And let me give you one example. In the Northern Cape, at the start of this year, for instance, the district local municipalities already declared the area as a state of drought and as disaster. But because of the red tape to get the money, that's where the problem is. Unfortunately, livestock cannot wait another day to say, we will eat tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is the Honorable Deputy President uh, prepared uh, to intervene with those, that process to speed it up? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Yes, I'm prepared to intervene. You would be aware that I'm chairing the IMC on land reform. Um, we, we want to work with farmers. And because you have mentioned farmers in the Eastern Cape, in the Northern Cape, in Free State, we spoke with the minister about this matter. And I've indicated my interest to visit those farmers so that I can hear from them what are the bottlenecks, what are the problems. Because in order to support farmers to, to ensure that we use our land productively, we must deal with all the bottlenecks that are between ourselves and the farmers on the ground. So we want to set up integrated support at a district level that will support farmers. But that will do together with the provinces, together with those municipalities. But in this case, I'll be glad if I take the first visit to go and discuss with those farmers and see the conditions of the affected farms and the extent, the scope and scale of the drought. Thank you very much. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Kebekulu. Uh, Umundo ai buga ayo ile ayo kuti na nanga be uhulume ni nyango imisenga rani uksiza abali minga be bethe leo inzizi integrate kuta kutina kufuta chabasa zagari so umbuzo ame upege ekteni nchonishwa yonke imali epuma ayo iyo sasa abali ingenye ayo aifige abali ma bali sube betinga uksiza zagari itina ipelele ezanze ni kuma officials. Naba tile aba seven desire to the Marie Pumes yet born. Nabi Umyang Akom Tonishwa Unguenza Ugu Peng, Susan Ectenini, was on a tile between the Sumis. A Guma small cane growers at Tintegil, a small holder farmers at Tintegil, Nama substance farmers at Tintegil. A band back Hali, Leguza Manja, when we sang an Mkulu, Emma Hall or Otwa, as I'm a figure in Maribon, Tonshangabas no Suma. I pay you this is in Tongo Gumyang Marking at all. Honorable Deputy President. Sia Bong. Since our seven Zana, no minister who talk what it is. Si seven Zana, no premier, Waleo, Naleo province. Si seven Zana, no MEC, where agriculture, Guleo, Naleo province. Si seven zisane, no maya, wenda. Into si zamguya akalapa uguti sonke, asi tlanga nenda onye. Gube yiti sonke, esi nileta in siza. Uprimia wenda, ufuna azu uguti in national department yenzani. In national department ufuna yazu uguti uprimia wenzani. Uprimia kufuna azu kuti umaspala wenza. Imali zonke siyo zikipu, ezi shangene, nein siza, ezi zletai. 
Sizoz letter zonke, sisugela sonke, good district. You model le eskabang gutizo seza, umasime good district, guna umas palabaning anagleon now. Sizo tangana songo district, ugut gong kesis of letter, sisiza balim, gusugele good district. Got again, um minister, and again, Germana Villa Shonak district. Uzo Sebenza, no premier, a Sebenze, no MEC. Ileo gain to see your ends of goody. Ima lesu e pumayo, no my puma national, no my puma province, no my puma maspala, ya figa umli. Yabom. The next follow up question is to be asked by the Honorable Clape. Thanks, House Chair. Deputy President, it is not only drought that is threatening agribusinesses and food security. The sector has recently experienced crop and animal diseases like fall armyworm, avian flu in poultry, and food and mouth diseases in the beef industry. How is government going to address these challenges to make sure no person in South Africa goes hungry as set out by President Ramaphosa during SONA. Thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Member. We want to affirm the US government that says South Africa has a lot of capacity to produce enough food uh, from the land that we have to ensure that no person in the country goes hungry. And we're going to do that collectively as a country. For instance, we've got the veterinary services in the Department of Agriculture, which has got programs that are targeting prevention and the creation of awareness, as well as reacting positively and promptly to any disease outbreak. Over and above this, the entities of the department, mainly the Agricultural Research Council, the Honours Board Biological Products, and the Perishable Product Export Control Board. It's in the forefront through research and innovation of developing smart agricultural technologies that will improve on farming productivity. That will reduce post harvest losses and increase resilience towards plant pests and animal diseases, especially in the light of the risk induced by climate change. By right, I'm saying as a country, as government, the Department of Agriculture will need to increase its capacity to deal with any disease outbreak. The institution that I've mentioned are capable to increase our capacity as a country to deal with those and to prevent them before occurring. Thank you very much. The last follow-up question is to be taken by the Honorable Stianason. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy President, uh, you may be aware that the Northern Cape Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development have done a report and in it it says very clearly that in the next three months they're going to require 111.6 million rand. And if rainfall doesn't happen in the Northern Cape, uh, it, they're going to require 612 million rand by the end of the year. Now, you said farmers are the lifeblood of the country. You said that we can't leave farmers to fend for themselves. And so the question I would put to you, Deputy President, is how is this funding going to be made available to the members of the Northern Cape? And will you support the declaration of the Northern Cape as a disaster area? because they quite rightly complain that the national government is often not willing to do so because then the funding has to follow that declaration. Given the figures we're talking about, will you commit to this funding? And secondly, will you support the Northern Cape being declared a disaster area? The Honorable Deputy President. Thank you very much. The question was raised by uh, the member who asked the question. Uh, Not, not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean the Mr. Krunevak, Honorable Krunevak. Now, in that question, he mentioned the Norton Cape. 
mention the Eastern Cape, mention Free State. And I've made an undertaking that together with the minister, I'll go to these provinces so that we can ascertain the problems. I, I appreciate the fact that you're aware that there's a problem and you have raised it with us. So it's important that uh, we satisfy ourselves, we engage, we talk face to face with the farmers because Northern Cape is very high in terms of agriculture. And some of the products that are produced in Northern Cape, they cannot be found anywhere else in the country. We're quite aware of that. So it's important to go and support those farmers. We'll talk to the Premier, we'll talk to the MEC, we'll meet with the farmers in an indoor meeting and hear their problems. And at times, and at times, I want to visit their farms, one or two farms that are highly affected by the drought. But, but I, want to, I want to raise one element here. Honorable Deputy President, let me just take the intervention from this Th member. Why are you rising, Honorable Member? Uh, 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 Honorable House Chairperson, since this is a repetition of a question, I don't know where was Honorable Stan Eisen when Honorable Grunewald already answered, asked this question. Can we give a new follow-up so that we maximize the efficiency of this session of the question and answer? Thank you, Honorable because Member. Because the question he asked was already asked earlier on. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mdlozi. Yeah. Honorable Stian Eisen, why are you rising? Deputy Speaker, it's clearly not a PhD in listening because the question I've asked is a completely different question to the Honorable Krunewald. Honorable I've asked two specific questions. Yes. Will he support yes, it being declared a disaster area? Will he provide the 111 million rand? Honorable Krunewald didn't and ask those questions. The Deputy President is busy replying to that follow-up question. You can now continue, Honorable Deputy President. Well, um, I said, um, uh, Honorable Krunewald, you raised the question, you interacted with the farmers, you didn't read this in the newspaper. And I said, I'm going to visit Northern Cape. I'll interact with the farmers. We'll see the extent of the damage caused by the drought. And together, together with the province, we will find a way of supporting those farmers. But I want to say, uh, to our farmers out there. When they do their business, if you enter into any business venture, whether it's farming, whether it's this, it's important to take an insurance. Because drought, anything can strike at any time. At least there should be something that comes from your insurance and probably government can support. It's important to note that and I'm going to tell the farmers that as much as there will be government support, there should be an anticipation that anything can happen to the business, so ensure your business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Deputy President. Honorable members, that concludes uh, questions to the Deputy President. Order. I point wish to order. thank order. Of order. I wish to thank the Honorable Deputy President point of for order. his replies. Thank you. Point Why are you rising, Honorable Member? I think we were invited today to a skill part by Bayer Dobman Flays, the Deputy President. That's not the point of order, Honourable do. Member. Please take your seat. Take your seat. We will now proceed with our business, Honourable Members. The next item on the order paper is a motion in the name of the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. The Honourable Chief Whip. <laughs> Di manok paga misa paga tikwa lendu. Indo yoba ku fifth term of parliament. Kuko umtimbi onga zange ukijwe. Kwa yeke ikaba alishiwa entimini. Di man di paga misa indo yoba magumiselwe ikomiti yetujana komiti leyo eza ujonga umtimbo chisibunzi. O wam slaba o wata twa yokuba nini wo konuguze ubuyi swekunga slaulwanga 
loko miti ke mai miselo ilendri yo wisomteto. Kuba kalo kumka kosiseko isatuko sama shuma mabina nestanu. Kuya si fumela indio yoba umshaba. Auna basemtu ino yetwa. Maubuye umshaba wabantu ebantu ini benga shaulanga anto. Si apagami sake indio ba loko miti. Maibe nama shumi, nabantu abali shumi elinanye. Bemi buto elandela yo ukongo lose amalungu matanda atu. Witi yei abe mabini. EFF libe kona ilungu. Ezinye minyi mibuto abe mabini kotwa. Ngenwa yendo ba ulobu zaza kwa ye wongu mtu ufunu kusonde la kuuo. Maupindi ufunwe. Lel komiti ifaka banyabantu wali shumeli nesine. Aba suga kule mibuto kuba kufuneka suki ibelo mtindu wa mshaba. Lel komiti zibuye unga pelanga unyaka mali lo sikuo. Uzo uniki ngayelo kuba siya lamba siya tupeka. Uya fune kumshaba enkosi. Honorable, Honorable Chief Whip, Honorable Chief Whip, will you just add you move the motion as it appears on the order paper, please? Bendi kalenga lo ndio indio ba ndi pagama ndi kapela ndi pagami sakana njalo indio yoba indu mayamkele I so move bakufunegis lungu. Thank you, Honorable Chief Whip. Honorable Singh, you had your hand up. No, th uh, thank you for your intervention, Honorable Chair. Thank you. I would have liked the Chief Whip to read the resolution as printed on the order paper for the record. But, but you've corrected that. No, Honorable Members, no, the Chief Whip was perfectly in order. It can be moved in any language, not necessarily in the English written on the order paper. And that's why I asked the Chief Whip to move formally, which she has done, so it's in order. I now put the motion. Are there any objections? There are objections, I put the question. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those against will say no. Deputy Speaker. I think the, the eyes have it. Sorry, you didn't see me. The DA would like to make a declaration in terms of Rule 108. Okay. The DA. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson. House Chairperson, the Democratic Alliance will not be supporting the motion on the order paper as it appears today, because what this, what this motion is today is the greatest hoax perpetuated on the people of South Africa. Let's be very, very clear. South Africa suffers desperately from a history of systemic exclusion of black people from land ownership in South Africa through a variety of discriminatory laws. And that is the truth, and you can trace it back with legislative dispossession of property and ownership in South Africa. What this has done is it's left many, many black South Africans particularly without security of tenure, without ownership of land, and we fully support efforts to ensure that we have redress and redistribution of land in South Africa. We have to put land in the hands of more previously disadvantaged South Africans. But the problem with this motion is twofold. First of all, it's premised on a constitutional review committee which itself is legally, procedurally, and, uh, and uh, constitutionally flawed. You cannot have a consultation process that culminates in a report that ignores over 600,000 written submissions because they weren't to the liking of what you wanted to achieve. That is not consultation. That is not consultation. That is a farce. It says we had a predetermined outcome, we asked people to give their opinions, and then we disregarded them anyway. It completely ignored the overwhelming amount of oral submissions held by the committee here in Parliament, where the, by, by far the majority showed very clearly that they were against the uh, amendment of the Constitution. It ignores the fact that people like Judge L.B. Sachs have said, and I quote, far from being a barrier to radical land redistribution, the Constitution in fact requires and facilitates extensive and progressive programs of land reform. It provides for constitutional and judicial control to ensure equitable access and prevent abuse. And as I said the other day, this plaster that you're trying to use to fix this problem is a smokescreen to the government failure of the last two decades. 
It doesn't address the root causes of why land reform and land restitution in the South Africa is not working and why it has not moved at a pace to ensure that we have uh, land in the hands of more previously disadvantaged South Africans. It will also have serious unintended consequences for our, for our economy. Most, production, most agricultural land is, is bonded and will have impacts on the financial services in South Africa. There's also no such thing, including VBS Bank, it'll have an impact on them as well. There's order no such on thing. The members, order. There's no such thing as expropriation without compensation, because what the government expropriates without compensation will be paid for by the negative effects on the economy. And if you want to see the end road of what you want to do here today, have a look at Venezuela, biggest human displacement in human history, biggest displacement in human history. Go and have a look. Go and have a look at what happened in Zimbabwe when, your beloved, members, when your beloved Robert Mugabe went down the same road, ended up with them. They're actually doing the opposite now in Zimbabwe because they realized the folly of their ways. But let's, let's be serious. Let's get past this hoax. Because now you're going to wait till March next year, which is the rising date of this committee reporting date, to actually grapple with this problem. This problem is far more urgent than that. And if this House and this government was really serious about land reform and land restitution, we would be sitting here over the recess period processing the expropriation bill. No special majority required, no amendment to the Constitution. We could do it in three months here in Parliament. If this government was serious about restitution and redistribution, we would speed up the hundreds of thousands of land claims that remain unprocessed in South Africa. We could do that easily. This government could spend the next three months doing a comprehensive land, land audit on well-placed state-owned land near urban centers where the real pressure for land and opportunity exists in South Africa. And this government would sit for the next three months, and this house would sit for the next three months, giving people title in tribal trust land so that they own the land that they live and work. That is what a serious party would do if it was cared about land reform and land redistribution. This is a hoax, and the people of South Africa are going to see through it pretty soon. The EFF. Order, honourable members. Thank you very much, House Chair. One of the guiding lights of the EFF is Franz Fanon whose birthday it was on the 28th of this month, once told us that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its vision, fulfill it, or betray it. Today, once more, Chairperson, we are called upon to forget our petty political differences and to forge a united front to fulfill not only this generation's mission, but mission of generations past and generations to come. The resolution of the land question in South Africa transcends this generation. It is a mission for which many of our forefathers died for and killed brutally. A mission which must be fulfilled for any of those who will come after us to prosper on our land. No one has been better placed as we are to for once and all change the constitutional superstructure of the country to reflect the pain from where we come from as black people and the glory which awaits us if we are bold enough, brave enough, daring enough, and progressive enough Section 25 of the Constitution, as currently stands, draws a moral equivalence between the rights of the dispossessed and the rights of the dispossessor. It makes the circular equal to the dispossessed native. It brushes out the pain of dispossession. It requires the dispossessed to pay the dispossessor for the land that was acquired brutally. The Sixth Parliament has rare opportunity to redress all these past wrongs, to allow the natives 
who have lost so much to reclaim their dignity back by getting our land back. As we have led this process before, we will lead it again. The property clause must and will be amended, and the land will be expropriated without compensation for equal redistribution and use. No longer shall we have a tiny, tiny circle minority owning the bulk of land in South Africa. No longer shall we be treated as slave in our own land, never. The EFF will participate in the ad hoc committee to make sure that the ANC does not even introduce artificial amendments because we are here to make sure that we get our land back to the rightful owners, which is the black people. Amanda. The IFP. Thank you. Order, Mr. honorable members. Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. From the onset, I wish to put it very clear that the IFP supports land reform and redistribution, and this is the cause that we have championed for so many years. The resolution of land issue carries with it the promise of healing the wounds of the past. Land has social, spiritual, and economic values. It has the potential to be the foundation of the renewed economy our country critically needs. Honorable Chairperson, Section 25 of our Constitution allows for expropriation of land with reasonable compensation where it's deemed fit in the public interest. The IFP remains of the considered opinion that Section 25 as it's currently framed in our constitution, is broad enough to allow for expropriation with no compensation. We need justification on why it is necessary to re-establish the Art of Committee on this matter. The constitution has not failed our people. It is the current policies of this government that is failing our people in restitution land. Therefore, amending constitution is never going to solve the problem of land in our country. The, the land that the government has already expropriated and redistributed to has been severely neglected. The post-settlement programs to assist communities in working the land has dismally failed. There are many farms that were given to communities, and those communities were never supported. As a result, these farms are no longer producing. Honorable Chairperson, we cannot put a plaster on an open wound without diagnosing the cause and the symptoms of our pain and failures. If we look at the current budget of the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, it is clearly showing that government does not care or is not serious in addressing the issue of land. It, if it was serious, the amount allocated to this department could have been substantially more than all the previous years. We cannot continue to pay lip service to the painful issues of land reform, and we cannot use such a matter, such a sensitive matter, to play politics. Our people have suffered, and that is enough. The IFP does not support re-establishment of this committee, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Freedom Front Plus. Fuerzadar, it is quite clear that there is a fundamental difference between the EFF and the ANC when it comes to land. The ANC wants to tell people that they want expropriation without compensation so that people have access to land. And then they say that there will be strict preconditions before expropriation without compensation takes place. The EFF, I think, is more honest as the ANC because for them it is an ideological issue where they say they want all the land and they want to nationalize the land. So at least they are honest when it comes to the land issue. In Afrikaans, we say, if you listen to the EFF and the ANC, that is just the cut family. You don't know if they are or if they are Some it sounds if they are fighting, some other times, it sounds as if they are in love with each other. The Freedom Front Plus wants to put it quite clear. All the honourable members, the member must is, be heard. That it is on record from this podium 
that we said that the process up to now has been flawed. And we will ensure that if you want to follow the legal way that you keep within the legal way. This motion should have a title. The motion should read a motion how to destruct the economy and South Africa's future. I say it again, and I say it quite clearly. Order, honourable members. If you allow the Constitution to be amended to provide for expropriation without compensation, you put South Africa on the same path as Zimbabwe. Mark my words. I say, mark my words. Voorzitter, daar moet geen onduidelijkheid wezen. Daar is mense wat dink, as daar gepraat word oor onteining sonder vergoeding, dan praat ons van landbouwgrond. Artikel 25 is baie duidelik, wat sê, eiendom is nie beperk tot grond nie. Dit sluit in roerende, as sowel as intellectuele eiendom. En daarom moet die mense van Suid-Afrika verstaan, dat hierdie moosie is een van die slechtste moosies vir al wat betreft die toekomst van Suid-Afrika. En hulle sal, hulle misnoe, moet te kenne gee en die vryheidsfront plus verwerp hierdie moosie en sal alles in ons vermoe doen om dit te voorkom dat die grondwet gewysig word. Die ICDP. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, the ACDP appreciates that the land issue is a very sensitive and potentially divisive issue, given the history of land dispossession in the country, particularly following the Land Act of 1913 and subsequent legislation. And while we believe that justice must be done, we also strongly believe in reconciliation and nation building. Biblical justice can be achieved through a process of restitution in our view, with compensation. And it is for this reason that we support land reform and restitution of land in an orderly and lawful manner. We appreciate the work that the Ad Hoc Committee in the Fifth Parliament did obtaining expert advice on this issue. And it is apparent from its report that experts consulted have advised great caution in this process, given that Parliament for the first time will be considering amending a clause in the Bill of Rights. Now, ANC veteran Mr. Vali Musa cautioned that in amending Section 25, the committee must take care not to dispossess those who have been dispossessed in the past. We need to be mindful of that. As well as the significant opinion of leading constitutional lawyer, Advocate Trengrove, who said and did not believe that the Constitution required an amendment as a matter of law, the ACDP agrees. It is equally important to bear in mind that the Human Rights Commission, who are the guardians of the Constitution, stated in no unequal terms that they are not in favor of an amendment to Section 25. Former Constitutional Court Judge Albie Sachs pointed out that providing for expropriation without compensation in the Constitution would be insufficient to address the failures of land reform. He referred to the Motlante high-level panel report and the failure to implement its recommendations. During public hearings of the Motlante panel, which took place over two years, many spoke scathingly about the role of state officials and politicians in land reform, describing them as vultures who steal the little people have left after decades of oppression and forced removals. How will this be prevented, Deputy President? The ANC has repeatedly claimed that expropriation with compensation will return the land to the people. However, as the Institute of Race Relations pointed out, this is fundamentally misleading. Land expropriated without compensation will be owned by the state, not by individual black South Africans, nor will it be transferred to them thereafter. Land acquired will be held by the state as a patronage tool and used to deepen dependency on and by the ruling party. This is the fraud at the heart of the expropriation without compensation. And while the ACDP remains committed to find solutions, we cannot support this motion. I thank you. Good.
Thank you, Chairperson. On behalf of GOOD, I would like to declare that we will participate at the ad hoc committee established by Parliament. Our position is that the current Section 25 in the Constitution does make provision for expropriation for the public good. GOOD supports land reform, land tenure, land restitution and land distribution that can deal with apartheid spatial planning and disposition. Our message is clear that public land must be used for public good. The whole debate around expropriation without compensation is causing a lot of policy uncertainty and that it impacts on economic growth. The sooner we conclude the process, the better it will be for the country. Thank you. The, the NFP. Thank you, uh, House Chair, Deputy President and colleagues in the House. Yes, indeed, it is true. Your dignity and your identity comes from exactly where you originate. The first question someone asks you today is not even your name. Where do you live? So I think it is very, very important that what has happened pre-1994, where the land was taken away from our people, must be returned to the people. But having said that, Having said that, we must also be mindful of the fact that Section 25 does provide for expropriation. There is no doubt about that. We have unduly delayed the process over a period of time to accelerate land reform in South Africa. Let us be honest about that. But what we find here today is that we're coming here as political parties at the expense of the poorest of the poor we are grandstanding, making this into a political thing rather than really addressing the challenges of people in terms of their land and their dignity. Now, the National Freedom Party will support any process that will accelerate land reform in South Africa. But we are also saying we are not a banana republic that you just want to go and take land from one person and give it to somebody else. That is not what we must do in South Africa. Let us learn from what is happening in the rest of the world and do the right thing. While restitution must take place, if there's a need for the ad hoc committee, yes, the NFP will support it, but let us be mindful of food security. Let us be mindful of even those land that we took and gave away. Have they been productive? What is going to happen? Let's look at the economy. Let's look at the bigger picture. Let us not do it because we want to score points and get votes. Let's do it because it's the right thing to do. That is what the National Freedom Party says. Now, the Constitution is very clear. The land belongs to everybody who in, in, in this country, to everyone who lives on it. So whether you are white, whether you are black, whether you are brown, the land belongs to everybody. Let us also be mindful that two wrongs do not make a right. There's a perception in South Africa that all white farmers or all whites have been dishonest, that have stolen the land. It is not true. This is causing disunity in South Africa. And the National Freedom Party says, for the purpose of harmony, calling ourselves a rainbow nation, let us work together in the interest of the country and the people we serve. The NFP will support this on condition it is the right thing we are going to do to address it in a manner that is not going to disadvantage anybody. Thank you very much. The PAC. Chairperson. Order, honorable members. Chairperson. PAC supports this. To be landless is to be subjected to endless poverty. Lay in the Funubu Trigo, ANC, Umsabes, and Linsabant, Maubuya Legut, and go. The AIC. Uh, Order, honorable members. Much. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson. Uh, there's no need for any fear. The amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution does not mean an exclusion of any person, but the inclusion of all. It is a lasting peace, and 
means equitable access to land. Most of the people are in a position to produce from the land of their own, which is very good indeed. This is going to provide full security for all and an end to poverty. A great challenge now that is facing our country. This cannot be by any regulation or policy, but by amendment of this section 25 of the Constitution without any compensation. We hope this is going to be done in a very smart and a systematic manner to the satisfaction of all. Without land, there can't be any agricultural production, there can't be any human settlement. So this has got to be done or to be carried out. The expropriation of land without compensation is not meant to offend anyone, but to assist all to gain equitably access to the land. The land belongs to all. So the ills of the past could not be addressed in anyhow, but by this approach, we have got to use this approach. So AIC supports this motion. The ANC. Comrade House Chairperson, Comrade Deputy President, the original scene was committed when the African and Khoisan peoples were forcibly dispossessed of the land and its natural resources. In 1913, this violent and inhuman act of dispossession was consolidated by Land Act Number 27 of 1913, which left the African and Khoisan majority with only 7% of the total surface of South Africa. This 7% was increased to 13% in 1936. The racist Union of South Africa that committed this crime against the African and Khoisan majority divided this 13% of the land surface into native reserves, into which our people were driven like cattle and goats and kept as labor reservoir for the colonial settlers. These crimes degraded and dehumanized our people. This degradation and dehumanization of the African and Khoisan people are the root causes of the deepening moral degeneration and social ills, including femicide, gender-based violence, abuse of women and children, drug and alcohol abuse, gangsterism, violence in schools, and domestic violence. In general, the loss of our national value system. All South Africans, black and white, who believe in human and people's rights in this house will support the motion tabled by the Honorable Chief of the Majority Party, Honorable Pemi Majodini. The adoption of this motion is a condition precedent for addressing the injustices of the past and in particular, the recovery of the humanity of our people uh, both black and white. Our glorious movement, the African National Congress, adopted the first Bill of Rights on the African continent in 1923. In its opening paragraph, it reclaimed the African humanity, Ubuntu, Wotu, and the right of people, African people, to participate in the economy of the country. This Bill of Rights was amplified by the African claims of 1943 and the Universal Declaration of 1948. Despite this national and international human rights culture, the Nationalist Party ascended to power on a platform of apartheid and adopted a host of racially discriminatory laws to enforce this apartheid system which was de uh, declared a crime against humanity. In 1954, South African women, both black and white, adopted the Women's Charter 
followed by the 1955 Freedom Charter after an extensive consultation with victims of apartheid. It is remarkable that all South Africans, both black and white, adopted the Freedom Charter that said South Africa belongs to all who live in it. The constitution of this country provides for representative and participatory democracy, which will empower all South Africans working together to resolve in a peaceful manner and not through land invasions, all <coughs> uh, the land question. All patriots and peace-loving South Africans know that restitution of the land to its rightful owners is a prerequisite for the realization of human and people's rights for which many men and women in South Africa and the frontline states fought and died for. Without the resolution of the land question, the regeneration of Africa that Pixley Saga Aseme called for in 1905 and the non-racial society that President Sifako Mapoho Makato Kuluviavi Atladiviya Mamurela called for in 1917 will remain a pipe dream. Chiwana Kinamulodi, Kilotwagima Buatzela, Repelele Deputy President Mabuza, Repelele Deputy uh, Speaker Pandimudise, Repelele Memudise, uh, Kopanugima Hata. Order, honourable members. Order. Honourable members, I put the question again. Are there any objections? There are objections. House Chair, the DA calls for a division. A division having been called, the bells will be rung for five minutes.
Honourable members, will you take up your allocated seats? You are reminded that you may only vote from your allocated seat. Order, honourable member. When requested to do so, you must simply indicate your vote by pressing the appropriate button below the yes, no or abstain signs. And if a member inadvertently presses the wrong button, the member may thereafter press the correct button. The last button pressed will be recorded as the members vote. The question before the House is that the motion as moved by the Chief Whip of the Majority Party be agreed to. Voting will now commence. Those in favour of the motion should press the yes button. Those against the no button. And those wishing to abstain the abstain button. Have all members voted? The table just note the members who are indicating that their vote may not have been recorded. The voting session is now closed. There's another hand at the back. Will the whips just assist the table because the table staff don't know the names of the members? House Chairperson. Yes, Honourable Member. Uh, the, that member's thing there is not uh, working. Please assist him. Can you just get the name of the member here to the table staff so oh, that it's recorded? Honourable Chairperson, can I, can I make a correction? My thing is working very fine. It's just a gadget that is not working. You must tell, you must tell your colleague Inform your colleague, he mustn't say your thing is not working when it's working. Order, honorable members. Order, honourable members, the result of the division is as follows. There is no abstention, 67 voted against, 189 voted in favour. The question is thus agreed to. The Secretary will read the last order of the day. Consideration of legislative proposal to amend the... Order, honourable members. Order. Consideration of legislative proposal to amend the Promotion of Access to Information Act 2000, number two of 2000, submitted by Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services. The Chairperson of the Committee, the Honourable Magwanisha, will address the House on this proposal.
Honorable House Chair, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services requests the permission of the House in terms of Rule 273, subsection 1, for the introduction of the following legislation in the House, namely the Promotion of Access to Information Amendment Bill of 2019. The bill aims to amend the Promotion of Access to Information Act number two of 2000. This is meant to revise and align its provisions with section 32 of the Constitution. The bill seeks to regulate the recordal, preservation, and availability of information in respect of private funding to political parties and independent candidates. On the 21st of June 2018, the Constitutional Court, in my vote counts, NPC versus the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services and another, confirmed an, or an order of constitutional invalidity made by the High Court of South Africa, Western Cape Division, which declared that PIA is invalid to the extent of its inconsistency with the Constitution by failing to provide for the recordal preservations and the reasonable disclosure of information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates. The Constitutional Court further ordered Parliament to amend PIA and take any other measure it deems appropriate to provide for the recordal preservation and funding of political parties and independent candidates within a period of 18 months. The bill will address the Constitutional Court's judgment by inserting a new chapter, Chapter 2A. This chapter will deal with the publication and availability of certain records of political parties in order to regulate the recordal preservations and availability of information. In respect of private funding to political parties and independent candidates, and to provide for matters connected therewith. The bill creates an obligation for the accounting officer of a political party, which is defined to include an independent candidate, to create and keep records of any monies paid or donated by persons or entities to a political party which is more than 100,000 rands. Any money lent to the political party, any money paid on behalf of the political party, assets, services, or facilities provided to a political party, and any sponsorships provided to a political party. The records must be available on social media platforms on a quarterly basis. Furthermore, the bill requires that the records be updated and be made available on social media platforms of the political party concerned two months before the election of the National Assembly, the provincial legislatures, and municipal elections, or a referendum. The records must be kept for a period of at least five years after the records were created. The Constitutional Court considered the right to make political choices and the right to vote. Upon deciding on whether there was a link between these rights and the disclosure of private funding information, the Court found that the Constitution envisages an informed right to vote. This is because in a democracy, Government is based on the will of the people, which is expressed through elections. The court found that if voters did not have access to all the necessary information to make an informed decision when voting, this can frustrate the will of the people. We request, therefore, that the House approve this request. Thank you very much. I now recognize the Honorable the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. House Chair, I move that the House, in terms of Rule 273, Section 3, give 
permission that the legislative proposal be, pre be proceeded with. Thank you. The motion is that permission be given to the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services to proceed with a legislative proposal. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. That concludes the business. Chair, ah, yes. would like to make a declaration. There's a request for a declaration. Thank you, Chairperson. We really welcome as the EFF the initiative as directed by our courts. It is important that uh, in the spirit of this particular amendment and legislative process to reiterate our call that President Ramaphosa must take the country into confidence about people, companies that funded his presidential campaign to become the president of the ANC. In the interest of access to information, we have the right as the South Africans to know who funded the CR17 campaign and what do they stand to benefit. Order, honorable members, order. This is critical, particularly for a president whose attitude and promises were based on the fact that he will be a transparent president. It is a fact that he doesn't deny that he received funding for his presidential campaign. He did not declare it in parliament, that's illegal. So unequivocally, we make the call and we reiterate, President Ramaphosa, reveal who funded you. Reveal their names, reveal also what do they stand to benefit. We're giving him an opportunity, because if he doesn't do so, will have to do it on his behalf. Or we'll have to go and approach our courts to force him to reveal the people that funded him and also what do they stand to benefit. That is in the interest of access to information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Order, order, honorable members. The IFP. Thank you, honorable uh, chair. I'm glad that the honorable member of the EFF accepts, order. accepts the principle that all parties who receive funding for their campaigns need to disclose. And to this end, we support the action taken by My Vote Counts, the original action. They've been at this for a number of years now, and I'm glad that the Apex Court has ruled that we have to bring about amendments to our legislation so that we can reveal all donations over 100,000 rand. But in considering this uh, amendments, Honorable Chairperson of the Committee, we would like you to note what the Chief Justice said, and he said, and I quote, the ongoing lawmaking process may comfortably run parallel to this judgment without the one being undermined by the other in any way. And this committee, when they're considering this amendment, must take note of the political party funding bill, which has been passed into law. We set up an ad hoc committee in the fifth parliament the only thing outstanding now is that we understand that there are about 5,000 submissions to the regulations uh, that will uh, accompany this act. And uh, we're hoping that on the 1st and 2nd of August, uh, these regulations will be made known because that's the day the IEC have set. And the sooner we need to disclose our campaign funding, all parties on all sides of the house, the better. And I don't think we should single any particular party or any particular individual in this case. Thank you. The DA. Thank you very much, House Chairperson. We weren't going to speak on this because it really is a technical amendment and we don't have much choice because the courts have directed us to do that. But I certainly think it is time that we do start to look at the connection between money and politics because there is a nexus there that can be problematic. We wouldn't have had issues like Basasa if this had been enacted five years ago. Uh, we couldn't have seen uh, foreign governments like uh, uh, Mr. Arafat's government handing over briefcases to Mr. Um, uh, Jainchi's party, and I see he's very finicky about that. But let me, let me just say this, that the good thing about passing legislation is that it then applies to all parties equally. And I think we need to start asking ourselves the questions. Who's funding these parties at fancy houses in Camps Bay? 
Who's paying for the business class tickets that are found in the rubbish bins of those parties? Who's paying for the Moe and Shendon and the Melis Rubicon that was found there? Why are politicians meeting with Mr. Anton Rupert quietly behind the scenes and keeping this away from their own parties? And more importantly, what interest would a business person have in paying for somebody's outstanding tax bill at SARS? And these are the nexuses that we've got to look at very, very carefully in politics because, because if it's not regulated properly, politics can really become a terrible place where money displaces the interests of the people of South Africa. And you've got to look at who the hidden hand is behind many of these particular parties. And I think that you look at the recent attack on people like the Honorable Praveen Godan and others, I think you can follow the money back very carefully and it ends up at Mr. Mazzotti's door and Carla Nix. You could see Mr. Andile Mgatama is uh, opposition to various things. You can trace the money back to the Gupta family. These are the nexuses that we've got to watch out for in politics to ensure that money doesn't taint politics in South Africa. So we will be participating in this and making sure that it is a responsible amendment. Because what you also don't want to do is to stranglehold a situation where only the governing party, through the dispensing of tenders and access, is able to channel money into their coffers. So we look forward to this new era of transparency and hopefully it, it will prevent things like Basasa, it will prevent things that we've seen unfolding in our body politics over the course of the last fortnight. Thank you. Freedom Front Plus. Voorzitter, the Freedom Front Plus started about two years ago with a process where we said that we have to look to amend the Party Political Fund Act, which we did. And my question is, why don't we start to implement it correctly, this specific amendments to the Party Political Fund? Because the Party Political Fund Act provides Firstly, that all people who want to donate money can donate it in a specific account with the Electoral Commission and that there are certain restrictions of, say, 100,000 Rand, which if you go above that, that you have to declare it. We have a period here in South Africa where tax payers' money has been looted because of certain political people and officials in the governing party. Not because of someone else from the public, because it's the political party who's in government that actually allowed these things to happen. Therefore, the Freedom Front Plus say, let's start with what we already have and ensure that that be enforced. You know, the problem of South Africa partly is also that we have some good legislation, but we do not enforce it. That's part of the problem. And I'll frag myself the frag af. Hoe kom sal a bepaalde skenker miljoene rande gee vir a bepaalde politieke partij wat die regering van die dag is, as hy nie iets wil teruggeen? A bezigheidspersoon doen het vir bezigheid. Nie, omdat hy een bepaalde ideaal nastreef nie. Ek ken baie sake mense, wat vir my recht uit sê, man, ek stem nie vir die ANC nie, maar ek geef vir hulle geld. Hulle dink ek stem vir hulle. Dit is niks anders, eindelijk, as een bedrag wat gegeef word om te sê, maar ek sal my dividende kry op dit. Laastens wil ek sê, voorzitter, wat die achtbare president betref, en die verslag teen hom. Die beroep van die vrijheidsfront plus is op die president. Neem die publiek van Suid-Afrika in jou vertrouwe. Ongaag van die verslag. Gaan voort. Ek is op rekord wat ek gesê het. Neem dit op hersiene. Maar neem die mense van Suid-Afrika in jou vertrouwe en sê wat er geld daar vir jou gegee is. Because Honorable Che to receive millions of rand for only for a campaign to ensure that you are elected 
creates more questions because why would you Honourable give millions member, to a president to become a president? I thank you. The ACDP. Thank you, House Chair. The ACDP supports this motion, and again, as other speakers have indicated, it must be read with the Political Party Funding Act that has been signed into law but is not yet operational. Why is that? Because of outstanding regulations. Now, there's a whole question as to why that act is not applied. We've passed it, it's signed into law, but the IEC is not implementing it correctly. That is a separate issue. I fully agree with the sentiments expressed by other speakers about the need for the disclosure of party funding, and that is why we supported the Political Party Funding Act. What we've got here is interesting because it is the access to that information. Now, we as the ACDP have raised this continually about my concerns in the Justice Committee that the Constitutional Court strikes down pieces of legislation that are passed by this parliament. The executive then delays in bringing the amendments. And then we are sitting at the last minute, the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces to effect those changes. In the Justice Committee recently, we raised that again. And thankfully, this now is a committee bill that is brought by the committee. And I want to commend the chairperson for that initiative because we need to ensure in future, the Constitutional Court instructs Parliament to amend the legislation when it strikes it down. We cannot wait to the last minute. There's already more than a year's passed since, the, since this legislation has been passed. So we need to be vigilant and in future pass more of these committee bills when the Constitutional Court strikes down our legislation. The ACDP, as I indicated, will support this bill, this motion. I thank you. Are there any further declarations? I put the question again, are there any objections? No objections agreed to. Honourable members, that concludes the business for the day and the House is adjourned. If I knew it would cause so much disorder, I would not allow it. All the members. Have a cup of coffee.